Welcome to Discover Indie Film. I'm your host, Jeff Howard. This is going to be a fun episode because I've got filmmaker Alex Cannon on Zoom with me. Hey, Alex. Hey, Jeff. How you doing, man? I am good. So if you are listening to this, understand that not only are we on Zoom, but Alex is in his car. He parked and he's chilling by the beach, which is wonderful. So if you don't like the audio quality, understand that this is a modern world where people use Zoom and you don't always have the best recording environment, but you sound pretty good to me. Good. That's all that counts, man. Thank you. And I do apologize to your listener if my voice is like three times louder than Alex's. I wish I could do something about it, but you know, Zoom does not let me adjust levels. So we got what we got. But I just talked to Alex. So if you're listening, if you're listening to the Discover Indie Film Podcast, the episode before this one was all about Alex and his award-winning film, La Cita, which is Spanish for the appointment. It's a wonderful documentary. In fact, it was at the Sherman Oaks Film Festival that I programmed in 2021, and it took home the Audience Award for Best Short Film Documentary. So golf clap for that. Wonderful work, Alex. I know you got other awards elsewhere, so it's got a really nice festival run. And this pod, so if you want to learn all about Alex and that film, listen to the podcast before this. This podcast is just for pure fun. Alex is going to answer the Discover Indie form. Man, what's with my mouth today? The Discover Indie Film for questions, which are just name three favorite films, a film that's underrated, a film that's overrated, and a lesser known film that people should seek out. And I will just, uh, I will be quiet, sir. You want to share three of your favorites? Sure, sure. I'd say uh, the 1984's The Killing Fields, uh, 1997 Terrence Malick's The Thin Red Line, and my third film, that's a tough one, I, I would say, um, hmm. <laughs> I would say there's so many to choose from, but I'll go with Darren Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream. That's your top Aronofsky, huh? Yeah, I would say so. I would say that's my number one Aronofsky movie. Yeah, it's sometimes true. I, I love your list. I gotta, I gotta throw in an extra mention for the Killing Fields. Amazing film directed by the amazing Roland Joffe. I just gotta yeah. share that it's written by one of my favorite writers of all time, a guy named Bruce Robinson. Bruce Robinson. After that, did a little film called With Nolan I that I thought was amazing. Yep, yep, yep. Nineteen eighty-seven. Another yep. amazing film called How to Get Ahead in Advertising. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Jennifer Eight and some other stuff, but, you know, he's like, uh, he's just this amazing British writer. I don't know how how these freaking British guys are just so good at, at writing films, but Killing Fields is yeah. an amazing film from an amazing okay. team, so I just want to back that up. And, of course, Thin Red Line, Terrence Malick. I love how divisive he is. Some people just totally groove on him, and some people are like, I don't get it. It's boring. It's so it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, yep. it's, a, it's a fun balance. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. And your last one was Requiem for a Dream, which is just talk about cinema. My God. Mm. Cinema he pulls, out, yep. he pulls out all the stops on that one. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's visceral, visceral filmmaking. It's so it's visceral. one of a kind. It's one of a kind filmmaking. It's in it's you're you're experiencing the character's downward spiral <laughs> type filmmaking. Not for everybody. I know, and he used all the uh all the goodwill and weight that he got from his his uh, not his debut, but his first success, Pie. Pie, brilliant. And to yeah. go from a film like Pie and say, you can tell, right? It was one of those moments where it's like, okay, Pie got some heat. What am I going to do next? This is my one chance to do something because if the second one doesn't work right, the career is over. And he just jumped on Requiem for a Dream, which was talk about a challenge to adapt that book. Wow tell four parallel stories did you know i read an article that clint Man, the brilliant clint mansell who did the soundtrack for requiem for a dream used s samples of sound effects from bruce lee kung fu movies and uh i think it was mozart and he turned them in reverse remixed them so the is actually the punching sounds i played backwards and spread out it's brilliant what he did <laughs> amazing just brilliant amazing. artist yeah, for sure. Actually, wait. What? What? What's the composer's name? Clint Mansell, who who did the brilliant uh, Fountain, the other Aronofsky movie. Yeah, he did a lot of stuff. Was he also in a? Was he in a punk band? Pop Elite itself. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that That's cool? Right. I I love these uh, yeah. 
another one of my favorite composers, I think is, oh my God, I might blow this clip. I think Cliff Martinez, he was like the drummer in a punk band. He was Dickies yeah. or something. And then, and then he went on to like make these amazing soundtracks, soundtracks for Steven yeah. Soderbergh. Yeah. And then for uh, Nicholas Reffin, another divisive, in my opinion, brilliant, one of a kind filmmaker. Yeah. He scores all his work. Yeah. Only God forgives drive. And, and, and these dudes were in punk bands that seemed like yeah. totally anti-music. And I know. These beautiful scores. Yeah. Majestic scores. Isn't that ironic? What, what artists? My goodness. Yo, sure. You can't, you can't judge a, a musician by what they're doing on stage. Heck. Well, yeah. Yeah. I agree. As a musician, for those who don't know, who didn't listen to the previous podcast, Alex is a, is a pianist, keyboard player, pianist, whatever you want to say. Sure. So yeah. you get it. You get it. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, we can move on to question number two, which is a film that is underrated. I would say, the, uh, well, um, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to give two answers because I need to draw attention to these movies. One is Mishima, Life in Four Chapters, Paul Schrader movie, 1985. Are you familiar with the Jeff? I do not know that one. Ooh, it's a brilliant movie. That's not a movie I grew up with. Just like I grew up with Koina Scotsi, which is another brilliant movie. Everyone who's listening needs to see Koina Scotsi. Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters, tells the life of the controversial but brilliant Japanese author Yukio Mishima. And it intersperses his, biograph- his biography with three things are going on in parallel. The last day of his life, his childhood, and some of his stories where the characters run parallel to who he is as a person. Crazy movie. Amazing movie. Brilliant Fantastic. soundtrack by Philip Glass. Philip, he did that after Koine Scotsi. He did the music for Mishima after Koine Scotsi. So that's a brilliant one. There's also a film I not many people know about 2001. It's a Brazilian film called Behind the Sun by Walter Sa- Salas, S-A-L-L-E-S, Behind the Sun. It's I, one of the few movies, poetry in motion. You're watching visual poetry and a haunting musical soundtrack by Antonio Pinto, majestic photography, so much acting, so much done with so little words. It's one of a kind movie. I wish it had more. I wish Criterion would pick it up and run it through a, like a 4K remaster and put it on his channel because it deserves that. It's a majestic, beautiful piece of work. You know, I... I... It sounds fantastic. I'll have to, I haven't seen that one either. So two good picks and I'll add, you know what? I'm going to say something just to piss off a bunch of people, which is Paul Schrader is amazing. And I think a lot of people know him as, you know, a frequent co- collaborator of Martin Scorsese, right? He like wrote the majority of Scorsese's best stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think Paul Schrader is the better filmmaker. I'll just come out and say it. I think yeah. Paul Schrader, I think people should do deep dives on Paul Schrader, man, because uh, he is, he's just, he's just an original and everything he does is, is a little edgier and a little more challenging. Well, I think Mishima, I, I, I think Mishima is his best work. I think in my opinion, it's better. I like it more than first reformed. I like it more than affliction. Uh, I, I think to date he hasn't beat Mishima, but I love blue collar. His first movie with Richard Pryor. And Harvey Keitel, but I might still give the slight edge to Mishima because of its artistry. <laughs> For sure. All right, I'm adding it to my list. Yeah, right, well, check it out. There. Question You'll question number three is kind of fun. It's a film that's overrated. The and Fable Man, because you're a naturally <laughs> kind person. I'll add that overrated. You're not saying it's a bad film. You're just saying it can be overrated. In fact, you could have said, you know, Paul Schrader's, you know. uh, whatever what what did you do mosquito coast or whatever like you could name like one of his bigger films and say that's overrated because all his other work is so great so overrated is not necessarily an insult i would say i, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is the fablemans spielberg's the fablemans and i and i do and i'll go on the limb and i i, I didn't like it at all either i thought i thought it was overrated and it was not good <laughs> and, and that's and now it's up for best picture i believe yeah, and that's up for best picture. Yeah, I think the oh, I think the two great movies I saw this year were, in only two two great movies. Number two is Banshees of Interaction, and number one would be The Whale. That's what I would put. <laughs> Fair enough. I haven't seen. You know, I watch so many films for the festivals. I don't. I don't I see that many of the ones that are out there. But truth is, when you say Fablemans, I ain't, I'm not going to watch that. I, no, it's so bad. It's so I'm bad. not a Spielberg yeah. guy. I I, yeah, I yeah. understand. 
by the way, when I say I'm not a Spielberg guy, I am well aware I am in the minority. The vast majority of the people on this planet love Spielberg's films. Yeah. And uh, I think his best thing is Munich. And I, I don't, you know, whatever. I agree with you. I agree with you. I think Munich is, I think Munich was definitely um, his most challenging movie. And I think, you know, it was a good script. He made you think it wasn't clear, good versus evil. I, I, I yeah. just think it's a great movie. He, yeah. did, he didn't hit us over the head with a score that everyone loves that I don't care for. Correct. Correct. I don't need it's those scores yeah. saying, this is what you must feel. I'm like, this Wait, is what you must feel. I know. You, as soon as you notice the score, the score has stepped outside its realm, I think. So, so take, for example, the music in Requiem for a Dream or Coin of Scott. Take Coin of Scott Seed. That music doesn't tell you what to feel. That music complements the experience. Do you? Totally. Totally. All right. Well, Fableman's fair enough. Uh, I'm sure you're in good, good, good company with that. I bet a lot of people on the podcast in the next couple of months are going to name Fableman's because, you know, how can you not? So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a Spielberg film that's getting tons of award nominations and stuff. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, if you're going to throw stones at somebody, you might as well throw it at the most successful guy who's ever done it. Because <laughs> you're just saying overrated. You're not saying it's a bad film, although you did. So anyway, I did. <laughs> last question. Last question is a lesser known film for people to seek out. Oh, um, well, I would say for those who haven't seen. Um, hmm, that's a great question. I would say. Um, 1952. Kenji Mizuguchi's movie called Ugetsu, U-G-E-T-S-U. Brilliant Japanese movie. I go back and, I mean, I, I love Kurosawa films. Mizuguchi is, his movie, he went where Kurosawa didn't go. Um, his exploration of, you know, the plight of women, the plight of sex workers, mm, uh, Japanese culture, and you know social hypocrisy he he really went there and ugetsu is a brilliant beautiful film wow okay hard to imagine a, a film made in 1953 that that tackles subjects like sex work yeah ugetsu doesn't but strangely mizuguchi made movies prior to 1952 where he did a movie called streets of shame which i think was in the late 40s and it was a doc, it was like you'd swear it was like a Cassavetes or early Martin Scorsese type movie, gritty movie that followed in a conversational way, like a Robert Robert Altman type style, um, Woody Allen style, minus the the kitsch, minus the the, the cute kitsch of um, these struggling post war displaced, uh, culturally displaced, and you know marginalized female sex workers. It was. Brilliant. He was a very compassionate filmmaker. Excellent. Well, and I'm just going to add for you, for lesser known for people, we've talked about it a couple of times, but if you're listening to this and you've never seen Koyana Skatsi, which of course is spelled K-O-Y-A-A-N, at that point it should auto, I think it's I-S-Q-A-T-S-I, I think. Yeah. I think I'm spelling it right. It. But, uh, yeah. you know, everyone should watch Koyana Skatsi at least once a time in their life. If not, uh, on an annual basis and put the phone away leave the phone in the other room man when you watch put the phone movie. away <laughs> and uh and i believe the dp of that film made something that i loved as a follow-up called uh baraka called, uh chronos that oh, was i never saw chronos but i saw baraka Ron baraka Frick. you know yeah. Kron i saw chronos when it was only at like those museums that had an IMAX. Remember when IMAX was only yeah. at a couple museums in the country, like it was in LA. Actually, San Diego had an amazing uh, right. theater and part of the museums down there in Balboa Park. Oh, okay, that's cool. But uh, but Kronos was, I think it's like a 30, 35, maybe 40 minute Short one, right? yeah. film that's the history of humanity in 30 minutes without words. Ah. So anyway, it's That's a cool. wonderful, wonderful companion to Koyana Skansi. I should see it then. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I'll check it out. I know. I got to figure out a way to download it or something because I don't even know where, where it can be seen. And, and I live with people who haven't seen it. I've got to bore the heck out of my 15-year-old and make her sit through these films and see what happens. I'll be yeah, like, right. 
I'll be like, okay, I'm going to handcuff you, take away your phone, and make you watch Koyana Skatsi and see what happens. <laughs> it's an experience to be lived watching that movie, Koyana Skatsi. Yeah. It really is. It must have meant a lot to you as a Chicagoan because, right, um, there's footage of those projects being destroyed in Chicago. Uh, th- those are the ones in St. Louis, Pruitt Ego. Oh, but, St. Louis. For some reason, I thought it was in Chicago. No, no, but but there there were so many projects in Chicago that looked like it. I mean, growing up, um, I would drive through the south side of Chicago, and they looked just like those uh, those from Prudy. I mean, man, that I'm 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 getting into a hypnotic trance right now just thinking of that whole sequence. Is I don't know between that and the opening scene and the end scene. It's probably my favorite in the movie with the music and the buildings falling, and it's good. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well. I was inaccurate in my uh, my Koyaanisqatsi trivia, but I'll, I'll own it. I'm not always right. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much, Alex. Alex Thanks, Cannon. Jeff. For those who uh, don't know, he was on this podcast, if you missed it in the beginning, because he made uh, an award-winning short documentary called La Cita, which is the appointment in Spanish. It's a breathtakingly great uh, and heartbreaking film. Uh about the violence that a transgender woman in in Tijuana deals with and and what life is like trapped between so many worlds in a in a in a society that is often abusive at a, at a societal level which it's hard to hard for people to wrap their minds around the fact that there are people who feel like the very society they live in is against them yeah and anyway i will hop off that and thank you again thanks jeff as far as uh, as far as checking out you and your work, people should uh, go to YouTube and search for Winston Sizemore. Is that the best way to check it out? Winston Sizemore Productions. And then IMDB, you could just look me up, Alex Cannon, K-A-N-N-A-N. That's my last name. That's my law firm name as well, Cannon Law Firm. But you can look me up on IMDB. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I didn't make it clear that Cannon is not spelled like the... Uh, Old fashioned wall buster from the mi- Middle Ages uh, awards. Right. It's not a pirate ship cannon. It's K A N N A N. K A N N A N. You got it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, people. You know how to find Alex and his work. And now I will wrap us up with, with my closing spiel, which is thank you for listening to the Discover Indie Film podcast. Be nice and like and subscribe to it. Doesn't, doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. Heck, you could even write a nice review if you want. If you want to learn more about this podcast, you can do so at discoverindiefilm.com. And on social media, it's at DIF Wins. And by the way, this podcast led to a TV series on Amazon Prime Video. I learned talking to filmmakers on this podcast that all the features were on streaming services. The shorts tend not to be. So we put it together with a bunch of people who had shorts and had done this podcast. And we did season one. Shoot, I should know this, but I think season one might have been 2018, I think. We're already on season seven, just came out. And I believe Alex's film, La Cita, might just be in season nine. Believe it or not, it won't be in season eight. Seven just came out. Eight is all dance films because... Just look at me. I love to dance. Or listen to me. I I live for dance. I do live for dance. I am the most awkward person who's ever tried to move their feet for uh, in a beautiful way. But uh, I just find when human beings know how to dance, I just find it so beautiful. So I was invited to be a guest uh, curator at a UK-based dance film festival. And I said to the, the head programmer, I'm like, do you want to do a season and discover any film that's all dance and you'll pick the films? Thank goodness she said yes. So I don't even have to worry about season eight. Someone else is handling season eight. So that's why I'm saying La Cita will probably be in season nine. And right, you find it just by searching for Discovery Indie Film on any Prime Video app. And Sherman Oaks Film Festival, that's where I first saw La Cita. You can learn about that festival that we hold every November by going to shermanoaksff.com. And it's at shermanoaksff on social media. Sister Festival every June. Film Invasion Los Angeles. You can learn about it at filminvasionla.com and it's at Film Invasion LA on social media. And the last thing that I'm going to throw in is, is I love uh, I love indie film and getting it out there for people. And we had an idea 
I had an idea. So now there, if you go onto your smart TV, whether it's Apple TV, Roku TV, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, you search for Editor's note, every time I say Hi TV, I should have actually said TV Hi. The service has been rebranded. It is called TV Hi, as in watchtvhi.com, T-V-H-I. And you can learn more about it on social media if you go to at watchtvhi. And that's always T-V-H-I. Back to the podcast. And it is all excellent content, excellent films, shorts and features that are particularly good to watch and even possibly better to watch when you're high. That's why it's called high TV, HI. But I swear to God, you don't you don't have to use drugs to enjoy film. Alex Cannon, thank you so much. Thanks, I appreciate you, Jeff. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank <laughs> you.